If you've had a birthday or an anniversary, we, we love to celebrate with you and sing with you, sing to you. If you'll just come on up here. Some of you that need prompting, go ahead. Prompt them if you don't mind. Tell them. Remember you had a birthday. I don't believe we've probably ever had a time where there was not a birthday or an anniversary. I hear somebody. Gene, tell me. Who is it? Who is that? Who's it? Oh, Mike. Is that Mike? What are you doing back here? <laughs> if you'll come down, we'll sing to you. Put your name in the drawing for the new bicycle. <laughs> Michael, there you go. These are too fine. Look at here. Now, who else had an anniversary or for a birthday. We'll sing to these youngins here. Good looking bunch here. Are you ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Good to see all of you. If you're visiting with us, uh, this is your first time with us. If you just hold your hand up, our ushers have a gift bag. We have one back here, uh, others back here. A gift bag to give to you. Uh, uh, some more up here in the front. A visitor's card. If you'll fill out that visitor's card, it's perforated. Tear it off. You keep half. Give us the information part. When the offering bag comes by, if you'll put that in there. And uh, we're so uh, happy that you joined us today. We do have a, a lunch prepared today. Think about and, it. And uh, you get to eat for free. Stay with us. We'd you love visitors, to. We, you visitors are visiting. We'd love to have you stay and get to know you, meet you. Stay with us for, for lunch free of charge. So happy to have you this morning. Uh, good to have Joey Goody back there in the back. Saw so Joey come in in the back. Amen. Good to have he and Lindsay with us. And uh, good to see him. want to remember uh, Lester Saunders is uh, really sick. He's in the hospital. So let's remember him, uh, Lester, Brother Lester Saunders. And uh, got a few reports that uh, some missionaries in Thailand are under yes. fire. They're being bombed God at bet. this time. So yes. let's remember uh, yes. them. Let's pray for them, especially yes. today, and lift them up in prayer. Let's get a songbook and stand together. And Ron will lead us in a number of this Amen. Morning. Page 265. Love lifted me. Thank the Lord for the love that God has shown to we who love him. And thank God for the love that we have one for another. Isn't it sweet? Don't you, do you love your neighbor? You love your brother? You love those round about you? No? Well, maybe not. <laughs> Look around you see, if you. see if you really love those. And anyhow, sing the song like you mean it anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who's that? Yeah. Sing it now. I was sick, deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deep, stained within, a sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despair and cried. From Lifted me now safe and 
about you. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. His will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be be saved today. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. course again ask the ushers to come love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me love lifted me when Brother Nelson, to ask the Lord's blessing on the offering. Bless you, Brother Nelson.
It's been some time since I made up my mind to make Jesus Lord of my life. And I've faced some fears, shed many tears, but patience has stood by my side. When I hear Satan say, you're not really saved, you're traveling down the wrong track. I recall once again where grace withstood sin. Down memories lane, I take him back. And I take him back to the time at an old fashioned meeting when the presence of God filled the air. When the saints were singing of grace and glory, sweet melodies seasoned with prayer. When one simple sermon from an old-fashioned preacher was like life to a poor dying slave, I walk him down the aisle to a place at the altar where grace fell and I know I got saved. Now I never knew love till it came from above and took its abode in my heart. The sun now shines brighter, my burdens are lighter since Jesus gave me a new start. My songs have been changed, my life rearranged, my journey is now a new road. And when that old accuser tells me I'm a loser, I remind him how he lost my soul. And I take him back to the time at an old-fashioned meeting when the presence of God filled the air. When the saints were singing of grace and glory, sweet melodies seasoned with prayer. When one simple sermon from an old-fashioned preacher was like life to a poor dying slave. I walk him down the aisle to a place at the altar where grace fell and I know I got saved. When one simple sermon from an old-fashioned preacher was like life to a poor dying slave. I walk him down the aisle a place at the altar where grace fell and I know I got saved. Well, I walk him down the aisle to a place at the altar where grace fell and I know I got saved. I take him back. I'm thankful this morning for my family, thankful for this church, and thankful that Joey got to come this morning. And, uh, he, would, uh, he would get on to me if I didn't sing this song, so I'm going to sing this for Joey. Please, he loves this song. Please come down to me. Know that I'm not worthy to call upon your name. All my life I've been a sinner, and for that I am ashamed. But I heard that you would listen, so I'm giving you my plea. I'm too unworthy, Lord, to come to you. Could you please come down to me? I know that there are others who could offer more than I. I promise you I'd understand if for me you had no time. Just hit bottom 
and I'm looking up to see. I'm too unworthy, Lord, to come to you. Could you please come down to me? I guess I must be reaping from the seeds that I have sown. Lord, you owe me nothing. We haven't spoken in so long. But if you could spare some mercy, then Lord, I'll pledge my life to thee. I'm too unworthy, Lord, to come to you. Could you please come down to me? I know that there are others who could offer more than I. I promise you I'd understand If for me you had no time I think I've just hit bottom And I'm looking up to see I'm too unworthy, Lord, to come to you Could you please come down to me? I think I've just hit bottom And I'm looking up to see I'm too unworthy, Lord, to come to you Could you please come down to me? Lately I've been looking back along this winding road To the old familiar markers of the mercies I have known And I know it may sound simple, but it's more than a cliche There's no better way to tell you than to say God's been good in my life. I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. And though I know I've had some hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. Cause through it all, God's been good Times replayed and I can see That I've cried some bitter tears But I felt his arms around me As I faced my greatest fears You see I've had more gains than losses and I felt more joy than hurt As His grace rolls down to me Undeserved For God's been good In my life I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams When I go to sleep each night and though I know I've had some hard times I wouldn't change them if I could Cause through it all God's been good 
before. God has been my Father, my Savior, and my friend. His love was my beginning, and His love will be my end. And I could spend forever trying to tell you everything He is. But the best way I could say it is this God's been good in my life I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night and though I know I've had some hard times I wouldn't change them if I could Cause through it all God's been to stop and just praise him sometimes amen God has been good God has been good Proverbs chapter 13 <laughs> yes he has yes he is Proverbs 13 well <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank him for his presence, that's for sure. Proverbs 13. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you, as Henry said, for your goodness. Lord, you've been good to all of us. You've been good to every one of us in the best of ways. And Lord... Even sometimes things don't go the way we want them, but you've still been good to us. And we know that you sit upon the throne and you hear us. So we pray for those who are in need today. And we thank you, Lord, for the good reports this week. And we just uh, lift your name up today. If there's one here this morning who's never accepted the joy of your salvation, they've never accepted you as their Savior, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict them of their need to have you in their life. There's a Christian here who, who uh, Lord, has, has wandered from you and drifted, uh, Lord, from your presence. And I pray they would get back into the center of, of your will for their life. There's another who has a need, a burden they're carrying. I pray that you would just meet every need this morning. We love you. We thank you. Thank you for your spirit. Be with the message this morning. And, uh, Lord, prepare hearts as only you can to receive it. For it's in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. This morning... I want to talk to you, uh, especially our young people, uh, about friendships. Uh, at some point in your life, you're going to find yourself close to people. Uh, the dangerous part is that there will be some who you want to be close with who are moving their lives in the opposite direction spiritually Amen. that you are. Even though you grew up together, even though you, you've been together for years, they at some point, for some unknown, they now have different values than you do, yeah. and different morals, yeah. and different standards, and there will be a part of you who wants to stay connected with these people. Now, this will probably begin sometime in childhood. It will escalate as you continue to get older. And understand, young people, it will drive your parents crazy. If you grew up in the average American home, your parents constantly freaked out about the people you spent time with. All of us had parents who said, you can't go to his house. 
You can't go to her house. You can't spend the night there. And you're like, but why? It's so great. Their parents are never home. We can do whatever we want. And your parents say, you just answered my question for me. So why did our parents, and why do we as parents remain so connected or so concerned about the people our kids spend time with? It's because our parents understood a very important principle, and I want you to get it today. Your friends ultimately influence the direction and quality of your life. I heard a true story about a girl who was just turned 13, and she was dating a guy who was 17. And her mom just completely lost it. And that 13-year-old just couldn't understand because in her words, he was so hot. And he was 17, which means he can drive. None of her friends could get around, but here she is at 13, and she has her own chauffeur. She couldn't understand why her mother kept telling her, you need to break up, this is not a good thing. She said one afternoon she was pitching for her softball team, and right behind the backstop was her 17-year-old boyfriend watching her pitch. All the other girls on the team just thought she had it all. I mean, her 17-year-old boyfriend is even coming to watch her pitch in her softball game. That little girl said I was grinning from ear to ear. That is until I saw my mom come around the corner. She slid up beside her boyfriend got his attention, and they both disappeared behind the concession stand, all while she's trying to pitch. She said, I knew what was happening. My mom was breaking up for me. <laughs> and sure enough, mom never reappeared, but boyfriend, or should I say ex-boyfriend, reappeared and sat with this sad look on his face. She said, sure enough, after the game, I got home. My mom informed me, you don't need to break up with him because I just broke up for you. And we would say, now, why would a mom do such a thing? Because mamas understand that when you get so close to people moving in the wrong direction, something must be done. And let me tell you this, kids, you're still in your parents' house, and they're still in charge, amen? Amen. And just as our crazy, overprotective parents were watching out for us, we're now doing the exact same thing with our kids, except we have an advantage our parents never had. We have an electronic surveillance system. We don't have to go anywhere. We can just go to Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter. We can check emails, texts, phone records. It's absolutely awesome. We can just spy like crazy, and we do the very same thing and interfere just like our parents. So why are we so concerned? Again, because we understand that friends influence the direction and quality of our life. See, here's the thing about friendships. The thing that makes friendships so great is the thing that makes friendships so dangerous. And I want to explain it this way. When you're uh, with a friend, you drop your guard. The reason we're attracted to certain people as friends is because we're all acceptance magnets. We hate rejection. We are attracted to acceptance. And when you find people who you think accept you, you drop your guard. So when you're with people who accept you, You are the most open to influence than you'll ever be. One writer said this, acceptance leads to influence. When I'm in an environment where I'm completely accepted, I am open to the influence of those people around me. That's why most of the time we act like the people we hang around. Either you've influenced them or they are influencing you. We close down around rejection. We open up around acceptance. Again, that's what makes friendship so great. That's what makes friendship so dangerous. Don't raise your hand, but I imagine the first cigarette you ever smoked, you were with somebody. Maybe the first drink you took, you were with somebody. 
The first time you saw something with your eyes you shouldn't have seen, you were with somebody. You see, your greatest regrets don't revolve around your enemies, do they? A lot of times they revolve around being with friends or so-called friends. Our friends have powerful influence over us. Why is it that 74% of Bible-believing college-age kids walk away from the church and their faith by the end of their freshman year? One word, influence. The people we choose to associate with have the power to influence the direction and quality of our lives. And so it can work for you, but understand it can work against you. Now, I would say you would probably not argue with anything that I've just said. You've lived long enough to know how powerful friendships can be. Or maybe you've just watched other people. Maybe it was your brother or sister. Maybe a cousin, a friend. Maybe your own kids are dealing with this. No one would argue it. But what's so fascinating is that there's no better place I know to find this principle stated than in the Word of God. And it's stated by the wisest man who ever lived, according to the Old Testament. And that was a man by the name of Solomon. And I want to read one verse today. And then give you some very specific application regarding your relationship to other people. And we'll be finished. Proverbs 13, you're there. Here's how Solomon essentially says everything we've said so far. Verse number 20 Solomon says, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. See, if you notice, the top half of this verse, it gives us a promise, but then the bottom half of this verse gives us a warning. First, let's look at the promise. Here's what Solomon promises. He promises that wisdom is contagious. That if you surround yourself with people that the Bible would consider wise, it rubs off on you. So much so that you'll become a wiser person simply by being in the company of other wise people. We may ask, what exactly would you consider a wise person? Or what does the Bible consider a wise person? Well, according to Scripture, a wise person is a person who understands that all of life is connected. What I mean by that is this, is that what you do today and what you think about today and your actions today will influence who you are tomorrow. That that what you did yesterday could have consequences today. That the choices you make will impact your life and that all life is connected. So the wise person, they don't make decisions based simply on today, but how it affects tomorrow and the next day and their future. And scripture teaches this is contagious. So that's the promise. Walk with wise and become wise. But then here's the warning. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Now I want you to notice this here. Don't miss this. The warning is not, if you're a companion of fools, you'll become a fool. And this is where we get tripped up because we assume that if I spend time with wise people and that's contagious, then that means if I'm a companion of fools, then I'll become a fool. That's not what Solomon's teaching here. No, the warning in this verse is this, that a companion of fools, a person who hangs out with fools, is a person who will eventually be impacted by the behavior and consequences of that fool's actions, whether you're a fool or not. Just hanging out with the fool, whether you behave like them or not, just being in their presence, you will catch the impact and devastation of their foolish ways. And Solomon says, they shall be destroyed. And here's why that's important, because some of you, Maybe a young person, you've defended unhealthy relationships this way. Well, I'll I'll never do what they do. I'll never act like they act. I'll never participate in things they participate in. Therefore, I'm safe. And Solomon says you're dead wrong. Because a companion of fools, whether you ever adopt the lifestyle or mindset of a fool, you will eventually be harmed by the outcome of that fool's behavior. You've seen this. I've seen this. There are teenagers buried in cemeteries today because they chose to be with the wrong people at the wrong time. 
There are young people in wheelchairs today who are paralyzed today who can never walk again because they're suffering the consequences of somebody else's bad decision. And it's what scares you and me to death as a parent. And here's what a fool is. The Bible says a fool is a person who knows the difference between right and wrong, but they just don't care. You say to a fool, don't you know where you're going, where that's going to lead? And they say, yeah. Well, doesn't that bother you? No, it'll work out. It'll work out. They just don't care. In fact, you know, later in Proverbs, the writer says, don't even try to correct the fool because a fool will just laugh at you. You, you can't say to a fool, don't you know what you're doing? If you continue to do this, it will harm you. A fool is not going to say, oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. No, they don't care. That's why they're fools. They live a life that is disconnected. I don't care about tomorrow's consequences. I'm living for today. They live life disconnected. The scripture teaches that a companion of fools eventually faces and experiences the consequences of somebody else's decision. And I guarantee you there are some of you who could come up here to this stage and you could tell your own story. Either about yourself or about someone else you know who followed the fool. See, this is not some new information. Sometimes we either forget and need reminding or sometimes, you know, the young person thinks they're, they're too cool or, or too smart or too connected or, or too popular that somehow they're going to be the exception to the rule. But listen, that's never the case. It will catch up with you. Young people, if you have friends who don't care about their lives, they're not going to be very concerned about your life either. And if you have a friend and they're not taking care of themselves, they will not take care good, a good of yourself either. And if you hang out with a group of people that doesn't care about their reputation, they certainly aren't going to work very hard to protect your reputation. If they're careless with their finances, guess what? Rest assured, they'll be careless with your finances. Now, as I'm talking, for some of you, faces are coming to your mind. You're thinking, how did he know? Have you been talking to my parents? <laughs> no, I haven't been talking to anyone. I don't need to. Solomon said this thousands and thousands of years ago. That if you continue to ignore this warning, you will pay for it. Or if you heed this warning, Solomon says you'll be rewarded. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So what I want to do right now, I want to leave you with four suggestions. These are just suggestions. But after listening to others tell their heartbreaking stories and, and talking to strangers, many who are, are homeless, I draw these four suggestions. I don't expect you to adopt all four of these. It'd be great if you did. Because I tell you, if most of the people I've talked to had had one or more of these red flags come up, they would have avoided some of the greatest heartbreaking experiences of their lives. Let me give you four suggestions, and we'll be finished. Suggestion number one. Young people, your, your conscious, conscience should, should just light up, should just convict you. Number one, when you catch yourself pretending to be somebody other than who you know you are. Amen. You hear me? When you catch yourself pretending to be somebody other than who you know you are, a red flag should just go up the moment you realize, when I'm with this group of people, I pretend. When I'm with this group of people, I try really hard to fit in even though that's not me. When I'm with this group of people, I ignore certain Christian values. I just go along with their values and ignore the moral values that I've been taught. And when your heart is saying, wait a minute, that's not you. You've been raised. But you find yourself moving away from who you really are. When you're around a group of people and you want to fit in so badly that you're willing to compromise... How you've been raised, it should bother you. 
And I pray you catch yourself and you stop and you turn around and leave that companion of fools. Amen? That's suggestion number one. Let me give you suggestion number two. Suggestion number two is this. Your conscience should light up. A red flag should go up. When you feel pressure from those so-called friends to compromise in your life. And when you begin to consider a behavior you have always considered off limits, that's when I hope something inside of you just screams, wait, stop. That is a behavior that is wrong, and I've been taught that it's wrong, and I cannot continue to move in this direction. And some of you, this is subtle, because we begin to have a conversation with ourselves, don't we? We begin talking to ourselves. And we begin to talk to ourselves into things we never would have done before. And, and we talk and we begin to dumb down our conscience. You know what else we do? We begin to withdraw from people who have high morals and good habits and Christian lifestyles. And we just slowly move away from them. So when you begin to consider something you previously thought was off limits and now it's an option in your life because of the people you're hanging around, yeah. I pray it bothers you and you stop and you turn around and you leave that companion of fools. Because I promise you stay long enough, you'll be there to get the overflow of some fool's decision and you'll deeply regret it when it happens. <laughs> Suggestion number three. Your conscience should light up. It should convict you when you hear yourself saying, I'll go, but I won't participate. Yeah. I'll be in the proximity of it, but since I'm not actually doing it, it won't affect you. And here's Solomon's warning again. Remember, it's not necessarily that you do what they do, but you're there when they do it. That's the danger zone. You say, but I'm not going to do this. I've been taught better than that. Solomon said, that's not even the point. A companion of fools suffers the harm from the fool's choice. Because when a fool suffers harm, you're just too close not to be affected. And you never know when it's going to happen. You never know when the fool's going to go in and get a, a little too drunk. By the way, we're against all consumption of alcohol. You still with me? You never know when they're going to be a little too high. You never know when they're going to be a little too loose in their morals. You just don't know. And before you know it, you're pulled in. So when you hear yourself thinking and saying, I I I'm going to go, but I'm not going to participate, that should be a wake-up call. That should be a red flag. That should be a warning that you've got to stop and leave that companion of fools. Suggest number four. We're finished. Young people are saying, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Your conscience should bother you. It should convict you. It should light up. When you hope the people that care about you most don't find out where you've been or who you're hanging out with. Amen. When you are already in your mind creating a defense just in case you ever get caught or just in case you ever have to have that conversation with them, that should bother you so much that you take a giant step back and don't go in the first place. See, the fool says, it doesn't matter uh, who you're with. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you do as long as you're not hurting anyone. Yeah. Wisdom says, if it bothers me, that the people I love and have respect for most would know where I've been and it bothers me, that ought to be a red flag right there. The devil will whisper, go ahead, live it up. You're young. You have your whole life in front of you. God says, listen, you're not promised tomorrow. You do not have your whole life in front of you. So I've set some boundaries of where you're to go, what you're to do, because I love you and I don't want you to hurt yourself. Now, other than the fact that it's really quiet in here right now, this is a reality for us all, isn't it? Not just young people. Now, if you choose to do nothing, 
with, with what you've just heard. If you, you choose to find yourself hanging around continually with a companion of fools, then here's what I would bet. I bet one year from now, you'll wish that you'd come back to this very day and respond differently to Simon, Solomon's wisdom to you. So here's my question. Will you do what you know the Holy Spirit's telling you to do with what you've just heard? Will you heed the warning that you will suffer harm if you continually hang out with people who are foolish? Because friendship is wonderful, but friendship is also dangerous. There are a bunch of parents here today and grandparents here today who are praying that their children and grandchildren will walk with the wise, amen, and not with the fool. Because your friends will determine the outcome and quality of your life. Close with this story. Chuck Swindoll tells a story about a man who attended his church who was a, a sergeant in World War II. Swindoll said, I just finished preaching on a, the passage, A Friend Who Sticketh Closer Than a Brother. And this former sergeant approached him and said, I want to tell you this story. It goes right along with your scripture, and it happened to me. He said, There were two friends in World War II, and they were inseparable. He said, They had enlisted together, they trained together, they were shipped overseas together. They fought side by side in the trenches together. They were, the sergeant said, in my own platoon. Great young men. This former sergeant said, during an attack one day, one of those boys was critically wounded in a field that was filled with barbed wire obstacles and he was unable to crawl back to his foxhole. He said the entire area was under heavy enemy crossfire and it was just suicidal to try and reach him. Yet he said, wouldn't you know it, his best friend decided he was going to try. Before he could get out of his own trench, the sergeant said, I, I grabbed him and yanked him back inside. And I ordered him, I said, don't you go. It's too late. You can't do him any good now and you'll only get yourself killed. He said, I'm ordering you not to go. Former sergeant said, I turned my back for just a few moments to bark out some other orders. When I turned back around in an instant, that man had gone after his friend. He said, it wasn't but a, a few minutes when that young man came staggering back. He had been shot, mortally wounded. But he had his best friend, who was now dead, and he was carrying in his arms. That sergeant said, I was both angry and deeply moved all at the same time. And he said, I shouted at him. I said, what a waste. He's dead. And now you're dying. He said, son, it just wasn't worth it. And that sergeant said, I'll never forget his final words back to me. He said, with almost his last breath, the dying boy replied, Oh, yes, it was worth it, Sarge. Because when I got to him, the only thing he said was, I knew you'd come back for me. I knew you'd come back for me. And I thought one of the true marks of a good friend, church, is that he or she is there when there is every reason for him not to be there. So, young people, I tell you, choose a friend like that. Choose a friend. Proverbs 17, 70 says, Choose a friend that loveth at all times. That's the kind of friends we as parents want you to have. Because your friends will influence you. And your friends will determine the direction and the quality of your life. So I warn you, and I plead with you, find yourself, young person, walking with the wise. And don't be a companion of the fool. Amen. As we stand together, heads bowed and eyes closed.
We get a song of invitation. Maybe you're here this morning, you have a need in your life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, a burden that you're carrying, a heartache that you're suffering, and you want to be remembered in prayer. Would you just slip up your hand by that saying, pray for me. Bless those hands. Any others? I have a need this morning. God knows my heart and my life, and I want you to pray for me. Are there any others? Bless those hands. Bless those hands. Young people, I've spoken today, especially to you. I pray you will apply to your life to walk with the wise. Don't find yourself in a companion of foolish people because it will get you into trouble and you will suffer harm. Then there's one more group here. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never been saved. You know, if you're unsaved, that's the biggest fool of all. The Bible says, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. Where do you find yourself this morning? Have you been saved? Have you asked Jesus into your heart, into your life? Have you made him the Lord of your life? If you're not, if you haven't, no one's looking around, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I just want to pray for you. You're in that condition. You're lost. You've never been saved. Would you just slip up your hand by that saying, pray for me this morning. I'm not a Christian. I've never been saved. I've never put my faith and my trust and my hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Would there be one? Just slip your hand up and put it right back down. Would there be one? The altars are open if any need to pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the promise that if we walk with wise, we will be wise. But Lord, thank you for the warnings as well. That we guard our relationships. That we put a hedge around who we allow ourselves to associate with. Help us to associate with wise people, not as fools. We pray for all those this morning who raised their hand. They have needs in their life. A burden that they need lifted. Lord, if they need to come this morning, the altars are open. Others are here, Lord, and maybe they're not saved. They've never accepted you. If they're in that condition, I pray the Holy Spirit would convict them of their need of coming to you for salvation. For whatever reason that someone's here and they need to pray, I, I pray that they would submit to your Holy Spirit. We love you and we thank you for your word. For it's in Jesus' name, amen. As we sing, if you need to pray. Page 410. Jesus, keep me. Come forward to this time. Bless you, hon. 